Good morning. morning. Merry Christmas. Christmas. (laughs) Um, We, uh, without further ado, we will begin uh, our service this morning with our first carol, Joy to the World. Take it away, Don. So grace, mercy, and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. So as we carry on with our service, we will light um, all five of the Advent uh, candles. which have marked our waiting throughout the season of Advent. And at last, as our song typically says, we light the candle kept new for Christmas Day. This shines bright for Jesus, newborn and here to stay. So Christ, the light of the world, has come to dispel the darkness of our hearts. In his light, let us examine ourselves and confess our sins. God, our Father, you sent your Son full of grace and truth. Forgive our failure to receive him. Lord, have mercy. mercy. Jesus, our Savior, you were born in poverty and laid in a manger. Forgive our greed and rejection of your ways. Christ, have mercy. Spirit of love, Your servant Mary responded joyfully to your call. Forgive the hardness of our hearts. Lord, have mercy. mercy. And may the God of all healing and forgiveness draw you to himself, that you may behold the glory of his Son, the Word made flesh, and be cleansed from all your sins. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. And so we continue with our service with our second carol, O Little Town of Bethlehem.
And so just as we heard song in that last verse, our Lord comes to us and abides with us. He is Emmanuel, God with us. And we celebrate that particularly in this season. So let's just take a moment of, of quiet, of silence, to just bring ourselves before God. Let us pray in the peace of this Christmas celebration that our joy in the birth of Christ will last forever. Lord Jesus Christ, your birth at Bethlehem draws us to kneel in wonder at heaven touching earth. Accept our heartfelt praise as we worship you, our Saviour and our eternal God. Amen. So now we come to our first reading, which Philip is going to come and bring to us. A reading from Isaiah 9, beginning at the second verse. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in the land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest. As people exult when dividing plunder, for the yoke of their burden and the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. You have broken on as far as the day of Midian for all the boots of the tramping for warriors and all the garments rolled in blood shall be burned as fuel for the fire. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time onwards and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Philip. And so uh, we're going to have our next carol, Heart the Herald Angels Sing, um, after which we will stand for the gospel reading and David will come and bring that to us.
Today, Christ is born. Alleluia. Today, the Saviour has come. Alleluia. Today, the angels sing on earth. Alleluia. Glory to God in the highest. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was took place whilst Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the city of David called Bethlehem, because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. In that region, there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a saviour, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth, peace among those whom he favours. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told them about the child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. So, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be pleasing to you, Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. So, after all of our Advent waiting, we celebrate the moment that the King finally arrives. For most of us, these verses in Luke chapter 2 will be really, really familiar. Indeed, for those of us at our crib service yesterday, we'll have had a very entertaining walk through the traditional nativity or not so traditional nativity scene. And for us here this morning, it's likely that we're very familiar with that nativity scene. Joseph and Mary caring for baby Jesus asleep in a manger surrounded by animals, shepherds and wise men underneath, underneath the brightest star you will have ever seen. But it's just because this scene is so familiar to us that it's helpful to look again at what it, what it says to us. And this morning, I just want to draw out just two things from these verses. Firstly, there is a sign. There is a sign. And secondly, there is a declaration here in these verses, a sign and a declaration. So then, the sign. Well, as we look at our traditional nativity scene, there are elements to it which we don't actually find in the Bible. 
For instance, over the years, the popular assumption has been that Mary and Joseph end up delivering the baby Jesus in a stable because of the presence of a manger, a feeding trough where they were staying. This has also been reinforced by the understanding of Mary and Joseph seeking room at an inn, as if it was some sort of first century hotel or public house, and then being sent round the back to the outside stable because there isn't any room at the inn. But actually, the word used for inn that is used in these verses has several meanings, and it's far more likely that they were on the ground floor of a house where people normally stayed upstairs and the ground floor would typically be used for bringing the animals in at night time so that they didn't get too cold, hence there being a manger there. And this makes a lot more sense considering the high value placed on hospitality in the Middle East. And so Jesus being placed in a manger as a sort of makeshift Moses basket is not actually about being in the squalor of a lowly stable, as we might typically think about it. But having said all that, the manger is still very significant. And it's indeed an unlikely element in the story. It's just that it's significant for another reason. It's because the manger is a sign that the angels give to the shepherds so that they know that they found the Messiah, that they've got the right baby a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. This is a very particular and actually quite humorous indication for the shepherds to know that they found the right baby boy. We just tend to kind of skirt over it because we're so used to hearing these words. The manger points to who Jesus is, just like we've seen John the Baptist do throughout all of our Advent readings. It's a sign to the shepherds, to Mary and Joseph, and to us, that Jesus is no ordinary child, that here was the Messiah, the long-awaited anointed one of God. No wonder Mary treasured these things up in her heart. Both she and Joseph had received messages through the angel Gabriel, but after nine months of pregnancy and the exhaustion of labor and travel, Mary could have been forgiven for thinking that maybe she'd been mistaken. But then come the shepherds, who she's never met before, by the way, saying that the Messiah was to be found in this manger. And that must have strengthened her faith no end, that everything was happening as Gabriel had said it would. I'm sure many of us have had the experience of sensing that God has said something and then found ourselves doubting later on because things haven't necessarily happened exactly the way we expected them to. But then we've been re-encouraged again, either through prayer or through the encouragement of others or a change in circumstances. I remember when my wife Beth and I were overseas joining in with the mission of the church in Malaysia. And after a few months of being there, I found myself really doubting that we were supposed to be there at all, even though we'd really felt God had spoken to us in the months before. But then, like the shepherds, we met a pastor who who we were due to spend some time with later on in our time overseas, and he was able to encourage us that we were there for a reason. And as our time went on, that proved to be true. And so just like Mary, we received a confirmation that we were still on the right track, even though things had been a bit tough for a while. So when we look at our traditional nativity scene and see Jesus asleep in the manger, we are looking at a sign, a confirmation to all that are present that this is the Messiah, even though it didn't look like a traditional royal birth. But alongside this sign, then, we have a declaration. The heavenly host announcing the arrival of Jesus to the shepherds in the fields is reminiscent of the uh, musical flourishes we would expect at a coronation nowadays. And this declaration of the arrival of King Jesus sets up a confrontation between the kingdoms of the world and the true and rightful kingdom of God. 
And so in the same way that we see the contrast between the arrival of the true King Jesus with the kingship of Herod in Matthew's gospel, here in Luke's gospel, we see a contrast with Caesar Augustus, who at the time is the most powerful king in the known world. And Augustus is taking a census, which is essentially, it's a tallying up of wealth and power. Augustus is kind of counting up all that he's got to make him feel strong and secure. And right in the middle of this man's act of hubris, we have the true king of the world lying in a manger, which tells the shepherds they've found the right little boy. And on first appearances, this contrast shows how vulnerable the baby Jesus would have looked in contrast to mighty Augustus Caesar. Jesus at this point looks a bit like a pawn being moved from point point to point of the empire just for the sake of this census. And it's true that Augustus would never actually meet or even hear about Jesus. But by the end of Jesus' life, he would stand in front of Caesar's representative in Judea, Pontius Pilate, and completely confound him with his wisdom. And then within a generation, Caesar's successors were feeling so threatened by the followers of Jesus that they were trying to kill them but they failed miserably because within just three centuries, the emperor himself became a Christian and the rest is history. It would seem that when the angels of God declare something, it's going to happen, even if it looks really different to how we expect. Still at that first Christmas, the declaration of the angels out in the fields that the true king was being born in Bethlehem must have seemed unbelievable. How could the king of all the world make his entrance onto the world stage by being born in such an unimportant town like Bethlehem and make his first bed in an animal feeding trough? But just as Jesus makes his entrance into that unimportant town to be greeted by those unimportant people, we see that right from the start, the message from the angels is true. This is good news for all the people, not just the important ones who would normally be at a royal birth, but everyone. And this actually takes us back again to the significance of being wrapped in cloths and placed in the manger. Because there's another reason why the shepherds of Bethlehem would have been familiar with this. The shepherds in the fields of Bethlehem cared for the lambs destined for sacrifice in the temple. And only spotless ones could be offered. So each spotless lamb was caught in the hands of the shepherds before touching the ground, and they were carefully wrapped in swaddling clothes as a sign of purity. They were then placed in a manger as it was just the perfect size to keep them from moving around and hurting themselves. So when the angels declared that Jesus would be found wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger, this was to designate him as the sinless lamb of God. Just as John the Baptist declares in John's gospel, the lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. I'm so thankful that the true king of this world is not a tyrant concerned with his own power like Augustus Caesar, but a king of the deepest love demonstrated by giving up his life on a cross so that everyone everywhere might become part of the family of God. This morning, this is the one we worship, our humble king who gave up the glory of heaven to meet us where we are. So this morning, before we we come to our intercessions and to communion, let's just take a moment to welcome Jesus afresh into our hearts. And to declare again that he is the king over our lives. That we want him to be the one whom we follow as we say goodbye to 2020. And begin again in 2021. So let's just take a moment to pause.
Amen. Now it's time for our intercessions and Marilyn will lead us from her chair. Jesus, as we welcome you today, you are the light of the world and bring hope and joy. We bring before you, Lord, your troubled world, preparing, praying for all na national leaders and all in authority. Give them wisdom to make the right decisions. Guide them in the way of peace, so as wars that cause terror and pain may cease. May all leaders work towards peace and the end to poverty and hunger. We thank you, Lord, for the vaccine for COVID-19, and we pray that people continue to keep the rules and restrictions so as the numbers of deaths and people in hospitals may reduce. We thank you, Lord, for all the work in the NHS and all the key workers. Keep them safe. And at last, there seems to be a way forward for the Brexit trade deal. And we pray for the borders to be opened. And today we pray especially for the lorry drivers stranded at the various ports and give thanks for the people who are helping them by giving them food and drinks. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for the worldwide church and to give thanks that we are free to worship when many are persecuted for their Christian faith. We give thanks for all who work in our diocese and we pray for bishops Martin and Gwilly. Guide them, Lord. Here in our benefice and at St. Peter's, we pray for Steve, Sammy, John, and the wider ministry team. And along with our church wardens, Don and Martin, we give thanks for their dedication and hard work over the last difficult nine months. And we pray that in the new year, they may be able to take time to relax, for they deserve it, Lord. Lord, in your mercy. We pray, Lord, for our families and friends. And especially today, we think of those who have not been able to be together due to the restrictions of COVID. Jesus, wrap your loving arms around them. Give them the hugs that we cannot give and ease their worries and anxieties. Lord, in your mercy. Jesus, we lift up to you all who are sick in mind, body or spirit. And we pray especially for all on our Sunday sheet and for any known to us personally. We ask, Lord, that you ease their pain and restore them to health and strength. We comfort all who mourn and we remember especially the friends and family of Sylvia Lewis and all on our Sunday sheet. Help them to know that their loved ones are with you Lord, in your mercy. Christ is born, give glory. Christ comes from heaven, meet him. And Jesus, we praise you. We give thanks for your forgiveness and love. And we offer you these our prayers and ask you to guide us through the year ahead. Direct our way, Lord and help us to think and to care for others. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. 
Thank you, Marilyn. Let's stand. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and his name shall be called the Prince of Peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Let's offer one another a sign of socially distanced but substantial peace. And uh, whilst I prepare the table, we'll have our next carol, which is Once in Royal David City. Once in Royal David City stood a lowly cattle shed where a Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is always right to give you thanks and praise, God our Creator, loving and faithful, holy and strong. You made us and the whole universe and filled your world with life. You sent your Son to live among us, Jesus our Saviour, Mary's child. He suffered on the cross. He died to save us from our sins. He rose in glory from the dead. You send your spirit to bring new life to the world and clothe us with power from on high. And so we join the angels to celebrate and say, holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. 
Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Father, on the night before he died, Jesus shared a meal with his friends. He took the bread and he thanked you. He broke it and gave it to them saying, take, eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the meal, Jesus took the cup of wine. He thanked you and gave it to them saying, drink this, all of you. This is my blood, the new promise of God's unfailing love. Do this to remember me. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Father, as we bring this bread and wine and remember his death and resurrection, send your Holy Spirit that we who share these gifts may be fed by Christ's body and blood. Pour your spirit on us that we may love one another, work for the healing of the earth and share the good news of Jesus as we wait for his coming in glory. For honor and praise belong to you, Father, with Jesus, your son and the Holy Spirit one God, forever and ever. Amen. So let us pray with confidence as our Saviour has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body because we all share in one bread. God's holy gifts for God's holy people. Jesus Christ is holy. Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory of God the Father. Amen. And so now I will um, I'll draw near to you and uh, we will retain the wafer to, to eat together. body of Christ broken for you keep you in eternal life Amen. the blood of Christ shed for you keep you in eternal life
So, God our Father, whose word has come among us in the holy child of Bethlehem, may the light of faith illumine our hearts and shine in our words and deeds through him who is Christ the Lord. Amen. Father of all, we give you thanks and praise that when we were still far off, you met us in your Son and brought us home. Dying and living, he declared your love, gave us grace and opened the gate of glory. May we who share Christ's body live his risen life. We who drink his cup bring life to others. We whom the Spirit lights give light to the world. Keep us firm in the hope you have set before us, so we and all your children shall be free, and the whole earth live to praise your name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. We will now have our final carol, O come, all ye faithful.
And so we come to the end of our service. Um, before uh, I just say the blessing, I just want to say a really heartfelt thanks to, to Don, who has just been at that desk basically throughout the, the entirety of December. Um, <laughs> um, to Diane, who has just enabled communion to happen throughout. Uh, and um, to all those who read and um, to all, all those who prayed this morning and indeed throughout uh, these last, um, these our Advent services. Um, thank you for all of the com- contributions you've made and for just so many people that have been involved in making things happening, uh, happen, particularly the choir in terms of all of the, the songs recorded, the carols recorded um, and put together by John. So just thank you so much, everyone, for all you've been doing. So it just leaves uh, me to, to bless us this Christmas day. Christ, the Son of God, born of Mary, fill you with his grace to live and proclaim God's love in the world and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Thank you for being here.